Welcome back to another episode of Visions for Health. I'm Wendy Trubo, and my guest today is Mitchell Levine, MD, Fellow of the American College of OBGYN. Mitch, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for being me. on the show. So today we're going to talk about minimally invasive surgery, organ preserving surgery. But before we get there, tell me about you. Where did you go to med school? Mm -hmm. Where did you go to residency? Uh, I went to college at Yale University, and I did my medical school at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I did my residency at the Brigham and Women's Hospital of Harvard University. So you're a real slacker. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Are you originally from either Connecticut or Michigan? I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, okay. honest, I ain't kidding you. <laughs> really? You, I've never heard the accent. No, I, I lost it. Okay. So how long have you been in Massachusetts? Uh, since I did my residency. So I did my residency from 77 to 81, and I've been in practice since then. Got it. All right. Now, when you started residency, there was not laparoscopy, or was there? Uh, we used it for just very simple things, like doing a tubal ligation. And since then, the technology has really evolved so that uh, you know, we can do most or many of our surgeries uh, you know, laparoscopically now. Okay. When you first started, was it, was it something people were doing, or was it sort of an outlier and nobody did it? No, I think it's really, the technology has evolved, especially over the last 10 years or so, so where we can do more and more. So now we're doing things that we never would have imagined we could have done with minimally invasive techniques. Okay. Yeah. So when you say minimally invasive, what does that mean? Yeah, it's always a good question because the joke is no <laughs> surgery is minimally invasive if it happens to you. But really what we're <laughs> trying to talk about is using either very small incisions in the case of laparoscopy or in the case of hysteroscopy, actually using no incision whatsoever uh, so that the recovery time is much quicker. For instance, a few weeks ago, I had, unfortunately, a woman with endometrial cancer, and we were able to do the surgery laparoscopically to remove the uterus. And literally, she went home that day, and I called her the next day. She said she was feeling fine. Now, not everybody is that quick, mm -hmm. but the, the recovery time is much quicker if you can do things with the very tiny incisions as opposed to the larger incisions. So in laparoscopy, just for our listeners, in case they're not sort of up on all these, there's a lot of oscopies in this. So hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy is a technique where you would go through the vagina, through the cervix, and look into the uterine cavity. So for instance, someone is having very heavy bleeding from a fibroid in the uterine cavity, in the lining where the baby grows when you're pregnant. And those actually could be removed by going through the cervix, seeing into the uterine cavity, and chipping out that fibroid or that polyp. And there's no incision at all, so really there's almost no recovery time. And then laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is basically making a little tiny incision, usually in the navel, to put a camera in, and then usually a couple of other tiny incisions uh, on either side. Sometimes a fourth incision is needed. <coughs> and uh, basically, a, now we're able, we have the technology to do a lot of that surgery. So if someone has endometriosis, we can remove the endometriosis. If someone has uh, not too big a fibroid, the fibroid can be removed. If someone, as I said, uh, unfortunately had an endometrial cancer, the uterus can be removed. So you can do a lot of those uh, surgeries now laparoscopically. There are other cases, of course, where the, the, uh, the fibroids are very large, where it wouldn't be practical to do laparoscopically. What's your cutoff when you're looking at laparoscopy and how big you're comfortable taking out laparoscopically versus when you say, no, I'm sorry, you're not a candidate for that, I have to open? Yeah, there's no absolute cutoff. It depends on the previous surgery, how likely there are to be adhesions. Um, and there also are certain reasons why we would not use laparoscopy. For instance, if there was any concern that the lesion might be cancerous, um, you know, we of course would not want to do laparoscopic. Uh, there are some cases where there's a low probability, for instance, in ovarian mass, that there's some suspicion about that you can actually remove the ovary intact, put it inside a little bag, and remove it that way so that there's no danger of spillage. Mm -hmm. But if you had a large mass that you were suspicious about, you would not want to take the chance of cutting that up inside. What's the largest mass you've ever taken out laparoscopically? Uh, probably 10 centimeters or so. so Maybe it's like, like four a inches. Yeah, like a grapefruit. But uh, we've actually taken out, I see a lot of women who have large fibroids who uh, want to preserve their organs. For many doctors, when they're large or many fibroids, the automatic response is to remove the uterus. Mm -hmm. And there's really many good reasons for the woman to keep the uterus intact. Uh, it plays a role in a woman's sexual function. 
It plays a role in the hormonal function. For instance, if you remove the uterus, even if you preserve the ovaries, which are really the source of the hormones, sometimes the ovaries stop functioning because the ovaries get half their blood supply through the uterovarian artery, which is cut at the time the uterus is removed. So uh, it, it plays a role in sexual function, hormonal function. Uh, many of the ligaments which hold up the pelvic floor, the bladder, the bowel are, are connected at the area where the cervix meets the uterus. So all those ligaments are very important. Sometimes those are cut during the surgery. As a matter of fact, if you remove the cervix with the uterus, which is commonly done, all those ligaments are cut, which can weaken the pelvic floor. And then I think psychologically for many women, they really want to keep their organs intact. I would like to keep my organs intact, unless God forbid it's <laughs> There's cancer. none that are optional. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, I see a lot of women, for instance, a few weeks ago, a woman came from New York who had a very large fibroid and was told over and over that the only option was hysterectomy. We were able to remove that fibroid, keep the uterus intact, and she was fine. And I actually have taken them out literally that weighed 35, 40 pounds, so really, wow. really big. And you can pretty much always preserve the uterus if that's what the, if the, if that's what the woman wants. They've even taken out 70 fibroids from a single uterus. So fortunately, the way fibroids grow, they have a nice capsule around them, so if you get into the right plane, like peeling an orange or peeling a banana, they peel right out, so you mm -hmm. don't really have to lose much blood. You don't have to damage the, the uterus at all. You can just remove all the fibroids and sew it back up. Let's back up, because you just told me a whole bunch Sorry. of really cool information. <laughs> Too much. Yeah. No, it was great. I just yeah. want to sort of parse it out. Yeah. So one thing you were talking about is when you leave the organs intact, you mm. leave the blood flow to all the organs. So one concern that when you take the uterus out, you impair the blood flow to the ovaries. Right. And if you impair the blood flow to the ovaries, women can go into menopause earlier or have lesser function in their ovaries. Yeah, statistically about 10 to 15% of women who you remove the uterus, even if you keep the ovaries, the ovaries stop functioning and they'll go into menopause. Yeah. That's pretty abrupt. Yeah, and actually if you remove the ovaries, which, are, which is very commonly done, then it's a very abrupt surgical menopause, which is much, often much more severe than the normal menopause. Normally you very gradually have a lessening of the hormones, and even postmenopausally, women continue to put out some level of hormones, particularly what we call androgens, which are responsible <clears throat> for your libido, your sex drive, your energy, your drive, your ambition. So removing the ovaries is very different than going into menopause naturally. Okay, so that's one benefit to keeping the organs intact. Yes. The next is sexual function, which we can't explore too much here. We're going to get lots of calls. Yeah. Then the next would be preserving how, I call it London Bridge, mm -hmm. from falling down. Right. So how often when you remove the organs, the pelvic organs, do women have difficulty with supporting the bladder, supporting the rectum? How For, common is Fortunately, that? it's not that common, but it happens enough that if you have a choice, in other words, the condition you're operating on is a benign condition, it's not a cancerous condition, that it is worth preserving those ligaments and support structures that keep the pelvic floor intact, that keep your vagina from prolapsing, keep the bladder from prolapsing, keep the rectum from prolapsing, which affects your bladder function, your bowel function, your sexual function. Um, so, you know, I think we were designed very beautifully and it's important whenever possible to keep that design, to keep that intact. Uh, we can't just sort of cavalierly go into the body and remove this and remove that and think it doesn't make a difference. Again, sometimes you have no choice in the case of cancer, but for benign conditions, I believe it's important to be as conservative as possible. So you're, when you say organ preserving, mm. you mentioned you operated on a patient recently. Was that a laparoscopic procedure or was that an open procedure? Oh, no, no, this was a very large uh, fibroid. Like literally? Literally that large. Yeah, she looked like she was full-term pregnant. Really? Yeah, so, and again, the, the uterus could be preserved, no problem. Um, even though many doctors don't think that way, but because maybe in a sense we weren't really taught to value a woman's organs, like, oh, well, they're for having babies. Once you're done with that, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But they, they, it performs much more of a role in that sexual function, hormonal function, health, you know, uh, support of the pelvic structures and your body in general. So, yeah, it's all designed very beautifully, and it's important to respect that. Um, it's not a very common opinion from mm. physicians, uh, I would say, of your era. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I really think that mm -hmm. his, hysterectomy were the number one surgical procedure, I think, 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah, still, it's, I mean, literally there are, I think, 600,000 hysterectomies done every year uh, in this country, and the vast majority of them are really for benign conditions. Uh, for instance, uh, most of them are done for uterine fibroids, which, again, you can always keep the uterus intact if that's what the woman wants. Mm -hmm. You know, they're done for things like endometriosis or... Uh, bleeding or pain, and, but there's more conservative endometriosis, you know, for endometriosis, you can just remove the endometriosis. If someone has cysts in the ovaries, again, if they're benign, you can just remove the cyst and keep the ovaries intact rather than removing the whole ovary. Mm -hmm. Even in cases where there's some suspicion, like uh, for that it might be cancerous, you can remove the one ovary intact mm -hmm. and then keep the other ovary, which still gives you normal hormonal function. For instance, a story that I've sometimes heard is a woman came in with a questionable cyst in the ovary. So the doctor says, well, it might be cancer, so we're going to remove all your organs. And then he goes to her postoperatively and says, oh, great news. It wasn't cancer. And yes, that is great news. But meanwhile, she's lost all her organs. She's mm -hmm. gone into menopause. Her general health, her sexuality has all been affected. So and even in that case, if we remove the one ovary, test it, mm -hmm. see if it's in fact cancerous, and then maybe we have to do the rest. But if it's not, then preserve the rest. So it's not good news. You didn't have cancer, but you've already lost all your sexual right. and pelvic organs. But you know, good news, we didn't have to remove them. Can we talk a little more about the hysteroscopy portion? Sure. So there's a number of things for heavy bleeding. Mm -hmm. You mentioned chipping away at the fibroids. If mm -hmm. a woman doesn't have fibroids, what are her options? Well, there's different kinds of treatments. There's hormonal treatments, basically variations on birth control pills. When you're on birth control pill or other uh, progestin or progesterone-containing uh, medications, the lining of the uterus thins out and tends to lead to less bleeding. Another way of doing that is the Mirena IUD, <coughs> which is an IUD, an intrauterine device, which is uh, filled with progestin, so that also thins the lining out. Uh, if that doesn't work or if, if that's not appropriate uh, in terms of the woman being able to take hormones, you can do what's called an endometrial ablation where you basically coagulate the lining so it no longer bleeds very much. Um, so there are, again, ways of approaching it short of doing a complete hysterectomy. Are there any things women can do in terms of prevention? Mm -hmm. You know, once they come to you for their organ-preserving, minimally invasive surgery, they've gotten what I'll call bad enough. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that they can do before getting mm -hmm. bad enough to prevent fibroids, to prevent heavy bleeding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, many of the diseases are related to estrogen levels. So, for instance, fibroids are dependent on estrogen. Endometriosis is dependent on estrogen. Breast cancer is dependent on estrogen. And women in this country are really suffering from a lot of those problems. Uh, sometimes that you get that in the foods we eat. Mm -hmm. For instance, animal products were often given the animals were given high doses of synthetic hormones like DES uh, to make them produce more milk, more meat, more eggs, so they make more money, but women are getting these unnecessary potent synthetic hormones. You have your own, you don't need theirs. So can we pause for a second? Yeah. So the, the hormones that are in the food we eat do transmit into our bodies. Yeah, I it's believe It's not they broken are. down by the cooking or by the processing. Probably to some degree it is. To some degree it is. Um, but I've had women, um, you know, I encourage women to, if they're going to eat animal products, to have what they call organically grown or no hormones added. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes women even just cutting down on animal products seems to improve some of the symptoms of mm -hmm. heavy bleeding or the endometriosis. Uh, certainly some of the toxins in our environment, like PCBs, have estrogenic uh, qualities. That water bottle. Right, the water bottle. So I think, I do believe that what we put into our bodies affects our health. It's somewhat of a radical thought. I know you at Visions totally subscribe to that, which is why I'm so happy to be there. But in much of the medical community, oh, what you eat doesn't matter, what goes into your body doesn't matter, which, you know, it just it doesn't make common sense. Do you remember those ads? Back, I, I want to say it was the 70s that said you are what you eat from your head down to your feet. I don't remember what the product was for. Yeah, I don't remember either, but no, I mean, it certainly affects you. And <clears throat> as you know, uh, you know, sometimes the people have sensitivities to certain foods that affects them. Uh, so, you know, certainly things like diet, uh, if you're uh, overweight, which, you know, some people uh, unfortunately are, and it's, not e it's easier said than done, but if you're able to achieve a more ideal weight, your estrogen levels actually go down. 
because the fat cells in your body convert precursors into estrogen. So if, you, if you're very overweight, you're going to have higher estrogen levels. So again, not to make anybody feel bad, but if they can, you know, through healthy diet and through exercise, which can be really fun. I try to emphasize, find something really fun to do, like dancing or yoga or running or something really fun uh, and able to lose weight, that will lower estrogen levels. So that was another amazing thing that you just said. That mm -hmm. So there's circulating hormones in your body. Mm -hmm. Your fat cells that are peripheral, mm -hmm. your arms, your legs, your, your belly, mm -hmm. convert that hormone into estrogen. Right. What difference does that make for women? Right. So what, so what it is is that all these estrogen-dependent diseases like fibroids, like endometriosis, like breast cancer, you don't want to have higher than necessary estrogen levels. And again, you know, some people just are naturally going to be somewhat heavier. I don't want to make anybody uh, feel bad or guilty, but... To the extent to which we can encourage people like to eat a healthy diet, to, to really get some good, regular, fun, vigorous exercise and, and get their weight back to, you know, closer to normal. Um, guilt is never a good idea. Right. <laughs> but if you can get your weight closer to normal, you know, that will lower estrogen levels and improve, you know, your uh, predilection to get those things. So even if I remove fibroids, I try to encourage people to eat well and everything so that the fibroids don't recur. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do people have a lot of scarring internally? Are there people on whom you've done this procedure multiple times because mm -hmm. the fibroids keep growing back? Yeah, if I'm, if I'm repping someone, usually I'm seeing more people <clears throat> in their late 30s and 40s where it's not that likely to come back. But if you're seeing somebody in their late 20s or early 30s, yeah, it's not that unlikely. It usually takes about 10 years for them to grow back. So you could have recurrence. I have operated on some people more than once. Mm -hmm. um, Generally, um, probably there's always some scarring when you have a surgery, but we've had hundreds of women get pregnant afterwards, carry and deliver normally. So it, for the most part, it doesn't seem to be causing a problem. Okay. Now, you also do bioidentical hormones. Right. What would be the value of bioidentical hormones versus off-the-shelf, mm -hmm. well, not quite off-the-shelf, mm -hmm. but other prescribed mm -hmm. hormones? Yeah. There certainly have been studies showing that progesterone, which is the natural hormone, is safer than progestin, which is the synthetic sort of equivalent. It's a totally different chemical. And they haven't done as many studies on the bioidentical estrogen. It just sort of makes sense to me that if I'm replacing a woman's hormones, I would give her what she had as opposed to what a pregnant horse had, which is pregnant mare urine, premarin was from, from that. Um, so if someone does need hormone replacement, and some women who are postmenopausal do have so much symptoms that they do need hormone replacement, we at least want to give as natural and as close to what the woman had. And many of my clients do tell me that they do feel much better on the bioidenticals than on the synthetic hormones. I was reading that the Premarin is excreted through a pathway that if, you're not, if your liver and your gut aren't functioning properly, mm -hmm. you're more likely to lead to free radicals and cancer-forming agents mm -hmm. as opposed to the bioidenticals, which go down a thoroughly different pathway mm -hmm. and are less likely to cause cancer, which was just so interesting to me. Yeah. No, it totally makes sense. I mean, if you're going to replace something, replace what's missing, not what some synthetic compound or what a horse has or something like that. Yeah. Do you also do some work with for infertility? Yes. Well, tell me about that. Um, it's actually one of the most or happiest things, you know, when someone uh, gets, gets pregnant because that's such a joyful thing for people. For many years, I delivered babies, too. I, my own daughter, who's almost 12, was my last delivery. I figured it doesn't get any better than that, and uh, I don't Quit do deliveries anymore, and I wanted to be home more with her. Kind of a crazy lifestyle, but a very joyful part of our profession is helping people get pregnant, being involved with pregnancy and deliveries. Um, so again, we try to you know, go over the basic things <coughs> and encourage people to do things naturally. Sometimes people do need medications or do need surgical intervention. But you know, it's amazing all the subtleties that are involved. Uh, I remember we had uh, clients that were both very high-powered corporate executives have been trying for years to get pregnant, couldn't find anything wrong with them. Finally, they took a vacation in Hawaii and they came back pregnant. So there's a lot of subtle emotional, spiritual things that go into getting pregnant. Now the couple where they'd been trying for a few years, and when I talked to them, it became obvious that the husband wasn't totally clear that he was ready to have babies. He had had, from a previous marriage, he had children. 
And once we really talked it out, and he says, no, I really want to do it. I, you know, really want my wife to have what she wants, and I really am ready for this. They got pregnant like a week later. <laughs> so there's a lot of subtle, interesting things that are worth talking about. And then, of course, do the basic, making sure there's an adequate sperm count, the woman is ovulating, does she need help with that, make sure the timing is right, make sure there's no anatomical or surgical blockages, make sure there's no endometriosis that's getting in the way. So some combination of voodoo and emotions and spirituality and actual treatments, but it's a very happy, satisfying thing when people get pregnant. So you take all this into account when you're with your patients. Right. I mean, the thing I really love is just talking with people. So. Sometimes I think like the fiber is my excuse to get to talk to somebody for an hour and find out about their lives and how they eat and how they exercise and how their relationships are and you know things like that. I mean, at Visions, what we do is look at your health from your physical body, mm -hmm. your biochemistry, your mm -hmm. emotional, energetic, and mm -hmm. spiritual health. Right. So it sounds like you're including all of those when you're discussing with women their lives. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so important and. Really, it's something that uh, it's like a privilege to be able to, you know, talk with people about stuff like that. And sometimes I feel someone theoretically was coming in for a pap smear, but really the important part of the visit was spending 20 minutes <clears throat> seeing how she could get along better with her husband and trying to help her understand and help him understand, you know, just like maybe, so I actually do marriage counseling for a half hour. <laughs> and that is totally satisfying because that's such an important part of life, their happiness and their relationship. Uh, so, or just talk about how their job is going, or talk about how things are going with their kids. Uh, not that I'm that smart, but just having someone that's listening attentively to you and maybe has heard other stories so it can help a little bit. I think it makes a difference for women. Yeah. I mean, I know you're very busy, so... Mm. What other things should people know about your style of practice? Mm -hmm. Well, I think probably the most important thing, in a way, is true informed consent because I think the educational part of what we do is so crucial because if someone really understands what they have, what might be causing it, what are the different treatment options, and there's no one right answer, uh, then they can truly make an informed choice. And women have amazingly good intuition, so when they're really given the facts and the information and the understanding, they can make a really good choice of should I pursue medication, should I pursue lifestyle change, should I have surgery? And there is no one right answer often. So I think a really crucial part of what we do is to get people to understand. And I always tell people, even if I spend a really long time talking, you know, there are probably things you didn't think of while you were sitting in the office, so call me on the phone. We'll <clears> talk <throat> some more. It's so important that people understand what's going on and can make a good choice. You know, Even if they choose to have surgery, if you go into surgery really understanding why and making that choice yourself, as opposed to being scared into it or mm -hmm. railroaded into it, then you're going to recover better. You're going to do better. So it's very important. Do you do any pre-surgical work with patients in terms of their approach to surgery? Is that something you do? Yeah, I think it's very important to, to again, you don't want someone going into surgery going in out of fear or feeling pushed or railroaded or not understanding what they're doing. So you know, I think it's really important that they understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and that there may be other options and that it's okay to actually wait and it's okay to not do surgery. And, you know, it's just so important that the decisions really be from them and that they make it with really as best understanding as we can give them. So. Do you recommend meditation or mindfulness or anything like that for patients? That can be very helpful, just doing some emotional prep work. There's a wonderful book called How to Prepare for Surgery and Heal Faster mm -hmm. by Peggy Huddleston. So many of my clients use that, and she has different exercises uh, you can use. Uh, just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big thing you're going through, and I think if you're emotionally and spiritually prepared, that's really helpful. Have so. you noticed any difference between patients who do that type of program versus patients who just barrel into it in terms of their recovery or their emotional and mental state afterwards? Yeah, I mean, most of my clients, I try to do that either through the book or just through talking to them. Mm -hmm. But people really seem to recover quickly. I mean, it's because I think that they are choosing it, so their whole energy is behind it. You know. How long does it take from the time someone's referred to you to the time they get into the OR? Is it long? You know, I really tell people, you know, there may be exceptions, like if someone has cancer or someone's bleeding so heavily that it's life-threatening. But most of these things are things that can really take your time. So I say, take your time to think about it. Let's talk more. So, you know, that, that 
don't rush somebody into it. Mm -hmm. but if, obviously, if someone needs surgery, we would do it the same day. But uh, often, you know, it might be a month or two or a year or two, and they wait. And then, you know, when it's finally appropriate, when it's obvious to them that they need surgery, then they will choose to do that. Okay. Yeah. Are there ever people who say to you, oh, I wish you had taken everything out at once? <laughs> Probably not, I would imagine. No, but... actually, most of the clients, um, I just got a really nice letter from someone just saying, they were just so appreciative that all their organs are still intact and they feel healthy and normal and the same. And, you know, they'd seen many other doctors who told them, no, the only option was to remove everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not the only option in most of these cases. So. Was she still having normal menses every month or heavy menses? Yeah, she was actually having reasonably normal menses. You know, this was on the outside of the year? This is more on the outside. But they, you can have very large fibroids inside and you can still take them out no matter where they are. No matter how many of them there are, you can actually preserve it if you're willing to take a little more time and do that. Yeah. As the show winds down, mm. is there anything that I missed asking you or that you wanted to share with our, our audience? Mm. No, I, I've just been so happy. I, I've been in practice for 33 years now and um, most of that time solo. And so it's just very nice to have the community now at Visions where I hate, and I'm learning a lot and uh, just feeling like like-minded uh, practitioners, doctors, nurses, chiropractors, acupuncturists, whatever, that really believe in uh, how a person lives and treating them well and giving them education and how, what they eat and their lifestyle and their exercise makes a difference. So it's really nice for me to have community. Was that a hard transition for you? The transition was hard, but once I got there, I was so joyful to be there. So, but yeah, it's always hard to close down your old yeah. situation, but I've been so happy since I've been there. That's pretty courageous of you, I think, to pick up and move. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a, a big deal, but it, it was definitely a good decision. Right. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. This has been wonderful. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Visions for Health. I'm Wendy Trubo, and my guest today is Mitch Levine, MD, Fellow of the American College of OBGYN.